Hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of CBI at 10. Uh, Happy New Year. I think I'm still allowed to say Happy New Year. Uh, We we're going to be talking about the energy challenges facing the UK right now uh, and what the government and business are doing and can do. Um, as a reminder, we've moved away from our weekly format of these to do kind of special ad hoc sessions when circumstances uh, should be interesting enough for us to do so. And given what we've had this week with the new energy bill discount scheme announcement, we figured that this would be quite a good one to do. Uh, so. Last September, the government announced the Energy Bill Relief Scheme, which expires in uh, March and expires end of the March this year. And this week, they gave us the uh, details of the successor, which will be lasting from 12 months and kicking off in April. So we thought today would be the perfect time for us to dig a little bit deeper, talk about what that means for business, what else it is that we could be doing, what else government could be doing, what else businesses could be doing, uh, and some real practical tips uh, on what this means for you. I am absolutely delighted today to be joined by Tom Thackray, who is a Programme Director for Decarbonisation from the CBI, who's going to be giving the CBI reaction to the government's announcements earlier this week. Uh, Juliette Sanders, who is Director of Strategic Communications at Energy UK, who's going to be giving an industry-wide view. Uh, um, What I've got from Juliette so far is a lot of practical tips, so uh, we'll be looking to her for those too. Uh, Paul Glendinning, who's Policy and Markets Director at Northern Power Grid, which is an an electricity distributor based in the Northeast, who's going to be giving us the business perspective on the challenges that the businesses are facing uh, and what they can do to deal with them. Uh, And Neil Hodgson, who's Deputy Director for Energy Intensive Industries and the EBRS Review Team. It's now called the EBDS Review Team, Neil. We're changing your job title live. Who's... Can do. There we go. We've done it. It's happened. Uh, Who's going to be providing some detail on the government's um, response to the announcement. So we will have some time for questions. Make sure you're chucking them in the chat. I've really been enjoying the uh, chat we've been having so far and the good mornings and the happy new years. Uh, so keep that, keep keep putting your questions in the chat. Uh, I think we should kick off. I'm going to kick off with you, Tom. Tom, can you talk us through what the government announced uh, and how the CBI have responded? Yeah, absolutely, Simon. Thanks very much. Um, and yeah, I guess as, as context and everyone on the call, I think will know how, how tumultuous a year 2022 was um, the market was already somewhat out of balance when um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine happened. And obviously that sent markets into further turmoil and we saw big spikes in prices. Uh, and that was throughout the end, particularly towards the end of the summer when the EBRS was was first brought in. There's also concerns about the adequacy of the UK supply of energy, um, you know, bubbling up in the media and um, through uh, publications from, from people like uh, National Grid. Um, so we've had a lot of incoming from members across uh, 2022 around those kind of issues, security of supply and, of course, affordability. Uh, this week, we've had the latest details from government about how it intends to support businesses with their energy bills. Um, and as Simon said, the EBRS comes to an end uh, at the end of end of March and will be replaced by the new EBDS, subtly changed. Um, so I, I will um, probably not go into detail of the of the particularities of the scheme, uh, but some high level thoughts. Firstly, new scheme will be in action for for 12 months, which is really good news. It gives businesses certainty um, over a longer period of time that, you know, this will be the regime that they're operating towards um, so they can work with that. Um, Secondly, I guess one of the major changes that it's a discount on the unit unit price uh, of energy rather than uh, the cap that was in place previously. So that's going to take some working out as to how it applies to to each business. Um, And I guess one of the major changes is while there is sort of universal support at a particular level for all businesses, there is an additional level of support for energy and trade intensive businesses, which I think is just in recognition of the fact that there are certain parts of the business community that are more severely impacted by high energy prices than others. Um, Some other reflections is, well, firstly, obviously the new scheme is deliberately less generous than the EBRS. Um, I think part of that is obviously to do with uh, fiscal conditions and the needs to to balance the books. Uh, So uh, according to to Treasury figures, the EBRS cost about 18 and a half billion over six months. This scheme is predicted to cost 
just over 5 billion over 12 months. So um, very, very different in terms of scale of the offer. Um, and I think part of that is also there is a, a view within government that, and probably within business as well, that it needs to uh, move businesses away from the situation where government is paying their energy bills. Uh, and that's more of a nice sort of ideological position. Um, it does introduce some targeting, uh, but I think there are limits. I think we found we're going through the review process. There are some limits to what can be achieved with targeting just because of the complicated nature of the energy market and how easy it is to get support to the businesses that need it the most. So I think that element of the new scheme is one that's going to be, I think, under scrutiny in the weeks ahead. And Neil might want to say something about that um, in the future. And I think businesses still come to terms about, you know, what it means for them and whether it's enough. And I think, you know, part of that will be determined about what happens to energy prices. You know, if we are in the happy position where wholesale prices remain, um, you know, at a slightly reduced level compared with where they were in the middle of last year, uh, then perhaps the impacts won't, won't, won't be that great, um, won't be that severe for businesses. But if we see the kind of spikes that we see that we saw last year, uh, then I think we're just saying to government, you know, it needs to be pragmatic and to monitor the hardship that some businesses might might face over the course of the year if we are still in that kind of crisis position. Um, so that's all I want to say as an overview there, Saima. Um, I'll hand back to you. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, just before I move to Neil, can you give us a bit of how's it gone down with with members? I think we are still actually in a bit of a working out what it means, given it was only announced on, on Monday evening and it has changed a little bit. Um, so I think it's great, as I said, to have 12 months of the regime. So I think initial expectations was that was that we might just get another six months. So having it over 12, I think, is good news. Um, I think there is a clearly adjustment for, for many businesses towards more market price rather than the sort of subsidised price, which will be a bit of an adjustment. Um, I think businesses are very keen to understand whether they will um, qualify for the enhanced level of support, which is there for energy and trade intensive businesses. And those who believe that they are in that segment of the business community want to know how they prove they are, they are in that part of the business community so that they can uh, make sure that they, they get the, um, the enhanced level of relief. Thanks, Tom. Um, Neil, I'm going to come to you now because... Uh, there's there's a lot there's a lot in there that's different from the last one, uh, and it'll be really great to get your assessment and your explanation of what that means for business and kind of what are the next steps in terms of how people can engage with this process. Okay, happy to do that, Simon. So, morning, everybody. Um, as Simon said, I'm Neil Hodgson from Bayes. Um, so, yeah, I think I think there's a few things. I, I noticed there's some questions in the chat already around how we've uh, decided which which people should be ETIIs. So, I will come on to that. I think there was there was three key points I wanted to make, and I think they're the three delivery challenges. As as Tom said, we announced this on Monday evening, um, and I think there's three things that are particularly different to EBRS. So one on the ETIIs, obviously there's a different level of support. That level of support will be 70% consumption. Um, so clearly there's a delivery challenge in terms of working out what 70% consumption means in the real world and over what period we judge that. The reason we have to use the 70% consumption figure is because there's a different level of support, we have to adhere to the Ukraine temporary framework. There are then issues we need to iron out with the EU and we need to adhere to the TCA. I think the second delivery issue is around the SICK codes. So obviously we've, we've put forward a list of SICK codes for those who are eligible for the ETII support. There is no other test then. It is literally, if you are a business that is in one of those SIT codes, you are entitled to the additional support. The challenge then is, obviously at the moment with the EBRS, we've been very clear as government that businesses don't need to do anything. Your supplier will contact you and the discount will be provided. Under the new scheme, Bayes will need to design a simple application process so that we understand and can identify all the businesses and other sectors that are in the ETI, so then we can ensure that that information is passed to the supplier. So for the end user, it will feel the same as the EBRS in terms of the maximum discount, if applicable, will be passed on, but there will be that extra step that we need to design, and we will work with the sectors in the ETII group to design and develop that so we can do it in the least bureaucratic way. 
in terms of the question, would you like me to answer the question on how we decide? Yes, okay, fine. So in, in simple terms, what we did was um, we looked at both the trade intensity and the energy intensity. So for the trade intensity, we based that on the goods traded using the ONS data. So to qualify as an ETI sector, the sector had to be above the 80th percentile for energy intensity. So in simple terms, that means you have to be in the top 20% of sectors by energy intensity across the UK. And then you had to be in the 60th percentile for trade intensity. So you had to fall in the top 40% of sectors by trade intensity across the UK. So that, that was how we decided that. And then just to reiterate again, the final point, that then means we have to be under the consideration of state aid rules and the new Competition and Markets Authority. So I think I'll stop there, Simon, but clearly we'll pick up questions as we go through, if that's okay. Yes, uh, as predicted, there are quite a few questions coming in already, Neil. So I think um, we're gonna, you're going to be coming off mute a little bit more uh, as, we, as we go on. So I just had a, one more question, which was um, the timing for this kind of stuff and, and when you're planning on coming out with a little bit more detail. Uh, and obviously, we are very happy to work with you guys and I'm sure we will be working very closely uh, on that. Um, very good question, Simon. I've been asked that question a lot since Monday evening. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, let, let's be honest, we, we've we not started the design on this yet. There's a, there's a commitment, there'll be no gap in support. So from the EBRS now to those who get additional support in the ETII, they, that will be in place from the 1st of April. So I think the announcement said we will come out with information by the end of March. I would I would hope we do it sooner than that. We've already reached out to some of the in energy intensive industries to work with them and starting sort of workshops early next week on that on those design questions. And I think particularly the question Alex War has asked in the chat that that is one of the primary things we need to start to work through around that 70% limit and how it works. And just in terms of that, it, it literally, the 70% limit applies just to the additional support. The other 30%, you will get support at the universal rate. Thank you very much. Uh, we will definitely come back to some of this detail in questions. I'll just give people a chance to add more questions into the chat. One of the things that I really wanted to talk about was uh, security of supply and, and demand side reduction um, and some of the other ways that we might think about making sure that we as a country uh, and as businesses are can be more resilient to future shocks, because what we don't want to have to do is for government to keep having to pay people's energy bills. We want to get into a situation where that isn't necessary. Um, Paul, it would be really great to get an assessment from you on where you see the security of supply challenges this winter and how that compares to previous winter. And I guess your hopes as well for going forward. How can we get more resilient? Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Seema, and good morning to everyone. Um, really interesting point. And, and I think we can use we can use this winter's challenge to feed into other aspects of our energy supply as we move forward. And, you know, there's a little bit of a negative around the net zero, which I'll pick up in a second, that people are playing with in the media, and I'm keen to get the facts and the understanding out there. In terms of the security, you know, there's been a lot of media interest in, in the, the want to use words like blackouts this winter, etc. Um, and it came from a, a National Grid report, which they, they have to issue every year. I'm going to say the August time to predict the, the winter. So, you know, you'll, you'll see when, when that comes, but it's around about August. Um, and what they say is they say, this winter, we're worried about these things and the system margin is X as a percentage. And the, the system margin being defined as what they believe the peak demand might be minus what they believe the generation capacity might be. Um, and they said it was very tight and it was very tight this winter and it was very tight the winter before, but this, this winter it's been tight and the, and the people were, were worried about two additional things really. Um, and it was around, um, European gas supply and availability of European gas. And you'll have read quite a bit in the press around the, uh, Europe, uh, countries adding to storage in the autumn and trying to, to import LNG to fill up their gas storage. 
and a very warm autumn actually helped us in the UK in a very warm autumn in Europe because they didn't actually use a lot of that gas in the run up to the, what would be considered the peak period. So the, the answer the answer around was it any more difficult this year? It was just a suggestion that um, that maybe we would run out or Europe would Europe are connected to us electrically. So it's electric electrically that we're talking about having the blackouts and the rationale around that um, in, in brief is that we probably get somewhere around about six. So between two and six gigawatts coming in from Europe. Um, and if that wasn't there because Europe was struggling for electricity supply, um, French have had problems with their nuclear fleet, etc., cetera, um, and they didn't have gas, then there may be some issues around that threat on that. And of course, because we've moved into net zero and we've got a lot of offshore wind and onshore wind on our system, um, if it was a, the, the situation that people are worried about is very cold days. So, you know, those classic cold winter's days with no wind at all, with a big high pressure sitting over the UK. So no wind generation and very cold, therefore high demand. So in the weeks leading up to Christmas, we did hit 44 gigawatts. Um, which is a which is a, a, a high that people were expecting, um, and if the, if it was windy, so between Christmas and New Year, I was monitoring it. There was twenty one. It was broke a record actually. That was the media point. Twenty one gigawatts of wind actually ran on the system between Christmas and New Year when the demand had dropped because there was no industry on down to thirty two. So the 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 the, the characterisation of the problem was, if it's cold, very cold for a few days in the UK. If Europe have a problem with gas, if the interconnectors are not giving us electricity from Europe, and and if it's not windy, so all of those four things had to add up before people would 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 look for blackouts. So we've prepared, we've sent a lot of information out. All the network operators have, National Grid have, all the network operators distribution wise have, and we've talked to a lot of businesses. I personally have run. Um, webinars and we've sent a lot of information out to our, the customers inside Northern Power Grid um, to try and explain what this might be. But it, but in essence, it was a very slight risk. But going forward, and you know, when we start to think about how this might it might come, any times in the UK that we have very low wind, so you know, very um, low wind conditions across the whole of UK and Scotland, then there could there could be a problem meeting demand. Um, and that's something which why people are adding storage in big ways at the moment. And just to sort of clarify, when people talk about blackouts, um, there could be a blackout this afternoon, because if four or five power stations fell over at lunchtime today, and, and we have a system emergency, there could be a blackout. If people can remember August 2019, there was some sections of network that blacked out. So, you know, businesses should be prepared for blackouts and be resilient. And there's a lot of businesses being coming to us and saying, are we on things like protected lists and, and things like that? But they should be prepared for blackouts. The rolling blackouts that we were talking about for this winter are generally between four and seven, a three hour slot where the peak would be uh, in the country. And then once the peak was down, then people could be connected back up. Unlikely, but I wouldn't tempt fate and I am touching wood um, because it's been so warm and there's been a lot of wind. So I think, in a, in, a, in a short of description as we can in the minutes that I've got, Simon, um, I'll be asked, I'll be open to uh, any questions on that. And uh, that, that's really the situation. The, the businesses that we spoke to are all worried that they could be off for six hours, eight hours. And let, let, let's explain that somebody's off now in Northern Power Grid's network. There will be a fault somewhere. And sometimes those power cuts run to six and ten hours. So if a business couldn't survive for for three or four hours, they really should be looking at their resilience systems anyway and getting some backup organised. I'll, I'll leave it at that same. same Thanks, opinion. Paul. That's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Julia, I'd like to bring you in here um, both to comment on the things about business, uh, sorry, like system resilience uh, and business resilience, but also some of the practical stuff that people could be doing to help to prepare themselves for this. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think first of all, on on the system resilience, um, it's it's worth just noting that in the National Grid's winter outlook, there's three scenarios that they presented. So the, the first base case scenario was that you know everything was fine. There's enough generation within the system. 
<clears throat> and then the second uh, scenario that they presented um, was actually where they could use um, coal, extra coal generation, but also a new service called Demand Flexibility, um, which would help to balance the system as well. So this is something that's relatively new that's come in, and that's where both businesses and households can help um, to manage the demand on the system by shifting when they use their demand outside of, of peak times. Um, and it's a really interesting concept. It's, it's in its early phases at the minute, but we'll see it growing and um you know, throughout this year, I'm sure. Um, and, and the other important element to, to raise about that is that actually businesses and households can get paid for that service as well. So it's it's really worth um, businesses checking if they're eligible for that, because um, that can both help to manage the system uh, and also provide an extra revenue stream for them. Um, and then it was only in that sort of third, as, as Paul mentioned, you know, very, very, you know, unlikely scenario that, that there wouldn't be enough enough power on the grid. Um, in terms of what businesses can can do to kind of prepare and, and improve their resilience, you know, I did, as, as Simon said at the beginning, I promised some practical tips. So, um, you know, the, the economic case for investing in, in energy efficiency is, you know, is really clear for businesses, you know, not just with the high prices to help them, you know, reduce their energy bills, but obviously the payback periods are now much shorter due to those high energy prices that, that we're seeing. Um, in terms of practical tips, it will be different for each business. So there's, you know, you can look at heating, lighting, ventilation, your manufacturing processes. So, so it will be very different across different businesses in, in the way that you approach it. Um, but Drax actually has some really good guides on their website. So if, if you look at Drax's website, and again, I can pass these on through CBI, but they've, they've separated out energy, energy efficiency tips into different sectors so whether you work in hospitality or agriculture or leisure and entertainment or manufacturing and, and there's more that i can't remember off the top of my head but um but they're they're very clear guides that are sector specific so i think that they're, they're probably quite useful for businesses that are looking to improve their energy efficiency which obviously has a financial benefit and, and, and a resilience benefit as well um, and they've split out those savings into sort of no cost low cost and, and longer term improvement measures so i'd recommend that um the government also has a, an equipment technology list, and that's that's a government approved list of energy efficient sort of plant and, and machinery. Um, and that covers things like boilers, um, electric motors and, and things like that. And for, and for a product to be listed, it must meet really robust criteria in terms of the energy savings that it can provide. So, again, that's quite a useful tool if people are looking for somewhere where they can just, you know, easily look at which which products they might want to invest in where they where they can be sure that there'll be a measurable impact on on their energy efficiency um and then obviously on on the other side of things as well as reducing energy waste and, and improving energy efficiency then businesses can also look at installing renewable generation themselves um so there's the smart export guarantee scheme that's that's available for businesses so that's for small scale low carbon generation and that's where businesses can get paid for the electricity that they produce and, and export and so you could have onshore wind or solar up to five megawatts and um combined heat and power as well and the thing about the smart export scheme export guarantee sorry lots of acronyms <laughs> to get your head around so the smart export guarantee you it's you can't be eligible for it if you receive the feed-in tariff, um, but you actually are eligible for it if you receive certain other government incentives, such like uh, such as the renewable heat incentive um, and Rego, so the renewable energy guarantee origins. Um, so if you want to take advantage of that, then you need to apply to an energy supplier, and it doesn't have to be the the energy supplier that you currently get your electricity from either um and then in terms of kind of affording all of this because obviously that requires capital investment and it's it's a very challenging environment for for businesses right now so it's it's definitely worth checking with your local council because there are a lot of um regional grants and, and funding available so whether it's a loan or a grant there, there are some good sites that you can check out so again there's a good government site that kind of um lists where you can search depending on on your region or sector so again i can share that um in the chat um, and there's also tax breaks available so on the capital cost of solar panels if you act quickly and then you can get you know super deduction on, on tax investment on solar panels as well um, and it's probably also worth noting that businesses are eligible for the boiler upgrade scheme so that's where you could get you know five thousand uh, pounds towards an air source heat pump or six thousand pounds towards um, a ground source heat pump as well and, and all of these things will not only help businesses save their energy but but they'll also help with the wider you know system balancing as well 
Um, so yeah, good sites to check out. There's a, there's a government website that um, which I can put a link in the chat. There's also the National Energy Foundation's UGEN website. Again, I'll put the link in the chat, but it's quite useful in terms of providing a list of installers and you can sign up to a newsletter. So recognising that grants change, you know, it's hard to keep up with what's available for, for different businesses, especially I, mean, I find it hard and I work in industry. So, you know, signing up to newsletters can, can certainly help. And the Zero Carbon Business website as well is, is probably quite useful. But yeah, we'll work with CBI and, and make sure that we get that information to people on the call. Thanks so much, Juliet. There's a lot uh, available on my CBI as well. And uh, Anna from Adelshaw Goddard has also volunteered herself to share a bit more information too. Uh, thanks for that. That was really brilliant. Um, Tom, one of the things that we talk a lot about at the CBI is energy efficiency and the need to reduce uh, the demand uh, on the market. And government have been setting out some kind of good plans on the domestic side. But I think it'd be really great if you could share some of our ideas on the non-domestic side, because that's been a little bit missing so far, hasn't it? Yeah, and I think I think the government is sort of on to the case to some degree in that it's set up an energy efficiency task force, which will look at both the domestic and the non-domestic side of things. And, you know, we're hopeful that they will come out with conclusions um, for the fiscal event in the spring. Uh, but I think, you know, one of the sort of quid pro quo is with this uh, bill support perhaps becoming less generous would be that maybe we can have a bit more of a focus on the longer term resilience. So it's less of a sticking plaster approach and more actually let's build a system which uh, insulates businesses, uh, literally insulates businesses uh, from from shocks in the future. Um, uh, and so, you know, there's various ways that this could be achieved. I think, you know, the tax system is is definitely one option that, that uh, the government could do to incentivize things. So looking at things like a super deduction, uh, capital allowance for investment in green um, uh, green capital investments, which could include uh, energy efficiency. And obviously that, that could be broader than that as well. It could also support businesses investment in um, on, on site generation infrastructure, for example. Uh, so that could be really good. Important to look at things like business rates and make sure that there's no disincentives in the system there where, you know, um, businesses are actually penalised in terms of the rateable value of the property if they invest in things which are energy efficient or um, generate infrastructure and um, clean infrastructure. Um, and I think things are slightly different um, depending on where you sit in the economy as well. So there's sort of general business support and I think Julia set out a few things which, which are useful there for, for companies. Um, but then on the industrial side of things as well, you know, sometimes the move towards energy efficiency is requires big capital investments and you're talking about massive transformations. And here, things like the um, Industrial Energy Transformation Fund have been really useful in recent years. And that's the kind of thing where we'd want to see a sort of a, a longer term trajectory uh, for that kind of government support, which will help those you know, core industries continue to play a significant role in our economy as they transition um, to the low carbon future as well. So I think there's, you know, there's a range of things that we'll be thinking about in the submission that we make to the Treasury for um, for the budget in in um, in March, and, and looking forward to working with members to kind of hone some of those asks as well. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, I'm actually going to move on to audience questions now because there's quite a few of them, uh, and I imagine it's going to spark a little bit more of a conversation. But before I do, was there anything burning that any of the panelists haven't had a chance to say that they make they want to make sure they do? Otherwise, I'll move on. Neil, this is your opportunity to say what government are planning in terms of energy efficiency and demand side reduction. I think I think Tom covered it. I think we've we've announced an energy efficiency task force. Um, we've announced a budget for that, and I think um, the task force probably welcome the CBI's ideas on on how to spend that money. I think I would say. And we're also uh, awaiting the outcome of the Chris Gibmore review, aren't we? Which looks yeah. at more detail about some of the net zero priorities for government uh, and how those could be implemented. And I think we're expecting that relatively soon uh, ahead of ahead of the budget. So that'll be good to see. Uh, Neil, I'm I'm going to stick with you if that's all right. Uh, some practical questions uh, on on the scheme uh, about cost. So how's that 5.5 billion resource? allocation being calculated uh, and how's that going to work? Is it a forecast of what it's going to cost or is it a cap uh, which could cause the scheme to close? 
So I think I think the simple answer is that's a, that's an estimate of what what we think the scheme will cost based on forward price curves and energy market movements. So that's that's probably the best answer I can give on that at this point. Uh, okay, I think I think one of the things that we thought about when we saw the announcement uh, was the need for you know totally recognize that government cannot pay everybody's energy bills and not everybody necessarily needs their energy bills paid but there are lots of people who do uh, and you know, for whom this kind of scheme has been a lifeline to make sure that viable businesses don't close uh, because of this so it's great to see that it is continuing um but one of the things that we were thinking about internally at the cbi was how do you make sure you don't close doors for future shocks and how do you not you know how do you make sure that those who really need the support are really getting the support so another question from you from from the chat around that kind of topic uh so there are concerns from some of this from some of the industries and actually speaking the theme in a few of the questions um so if a scheme if, if a company is excluded, how, how are you going to be dealing with anomalies is the first half of my question as I praise see everybody's questions on this. Uh, and the second one is um, where a larger company is excluded, that can also massively impact um, supply chains. So how, how are you guys thinking about that one, where supply chains might be impacted by larger companies not getting support? Yeah, so I think, <clears throat> so obviously um, we've had to draw the line somewhere in terms of that additional support. Um, I think we are conscious looking at wider supply chains. So something that particularly has come up this week dealing with some of the energy intensives is the supply chains around hospitality, who, who clearly are on the lower level of support. Um, in terms of anomalies, um, I, I think as, as we stand at the moment, the, the, the policy is set in terms of who will get additional support and who will get universal. I think in terms of the application process, we need to work, deliver and develop across the sectors for that additional support. That may iron out any of the anomalies that, that you would that you sort of reference, Simon. But I think I think that's where we are at the moment. We've announced something at a high level, we've announced the prices, we've announced an additional scheme with additional support. We now need to work through that based on the SIT codes and application and then work through if there are any of these anomalies. Thank you very much. Um, Tom, I'm gonna I'm gonna give him a little bit of a break here and I'm gonna come to you. Uh, there's a lot um, of concern and Paul, it'll be good to get your thoughts on this as well. There's one of the questions in the chat was talking about next winter being worse than this winter, both geopolitically and um, weather-wise, which has an impact. What do you think? Do you think that's gonna be likely? Um, and what are we doing to make sure we have better resilience in the system? You're really, you're really testing my skills there, Simon, in terms of my, my weather forecasting ability, my knowledge of interconnected energy systems. So I'm, I'm, I'll be grateful if others can chip in with their thoughts. I, what I will say is that in conversations I'm having with energy experts, forecasters, uh, businesses on the demand side, they don't think that we're out of the woods uh, by any stretch of the imagination. So although uh, wholesale prices have subsided recently in recent weeks, um, as Paul set out, uh, because it was it was warm and windy. Um, it feels like it's on a knife edge and it doesn't take very much. You know, you sort of had the example uh, before Christmas when some of the French nuclear fleet went off offline and what that did to the wholesale price in just a couple of days was quite significant. So you see, just, you know, we are so interconnected and interdependent with what's going on in Europe and, you know, what's going on in in Ukraine, uh, that there can be no confidence that, you know, the relative ease that we've seen recently can be maintained um, throughout the year and particularly looking into into next winter where we'll have to refill all the gas supplies uh, across across Europe as well. So there's, I think there's concerns about what that might do for the price for businesses as supplies become constrained and then there will be concerns once again as we're looking into the winter about what that will mean for security of supply and so we can't really afford to think oh you know phew, we made it through this winter and you know we're okay now i think to the extent to which we both for affordability and for security of supply we can start to do the uh, contingency planning now for what might be needed in the event of those shocks in the future um, that's something that we're sort of very keen to be working with government on uh, at the same time as obviously there's got to be co-design of the things like the, the EBDS uh, over over the next few weeks. Um, 
Tom, so, just, just I, I'm going to pick on you again, uh, because I think what you were talking there about that future resilience and the resilience to future shocks, and that's you, you talked about our budget submission and the sorts of things that we're putting in there around energy efficiency. But you and I spend lots of time talking about this. Uh, and one of the things that you talk a lot about is how you can kind of change the makeup of the UK system to have more security of supply and be less reliant on gas imports to generate electricity and things like that. If you had a wish list, if you know the Chancellor is going to stand up in March and say we're going to do this, what would you want that to be on that kind of security of supply point? Yeah, I, I think um, well, there's definitely energy efficiency helps with security of supply in the first instance. So we use less, we're more secure. So that's the that's the first thing. We'd definitely be banging bang that drum. But then you know, we've just got to accelerate the the energy transition towards this sort of low carbon, lower cost renewables backed up with with nuclear. Uh, and maybe hydrogen in the future, and all of those things that were in the you were under Boris Johnson government, we had the British Energy Security Strategy, which has really big targets. But what we wanted to deliver on some of those key technologies, um, but it's a hell of a lot of infrastructure to build in a very short space of time. So we've just got to be much better at the delivery side of things, and that means you know focusing on the planning side of things and making sure that we can build these things out quickly, making good on the commitments to sort of you know cut timeframes for planning and consenting for offshore from whatever it is four years down to one you know that we there are things that don't cost a lot of money can be politically quite challenging but are growth enhancing and also protect the security of supply so um, a big focus on that is where i think will be uh, and just to add to that um answering my question there's also practical things like whether the grid is capable of dealing with it uh, and how grid infrastructure needs to be upgraded to make sure we can have a future uh, energy system in there. Juliet, you were nodding furiously during a lot of that. I'm assuming you have lots of thoughts on what your wish list is for this too. Yeah, no, so we're, we're pulling together our budget submission, but I completely agree with Tom. You know, it's, it's about energy efficiency and making sure that we're prepared in the long term for resilience. You know, it just, it just makes complete sense. But then also on the wider generation side, you know, it's, it is worth noting that the huge cost reductions that we've seen in renewables recently, you know, onshore wind, offshore wind, solar, now some of the cheapest forms of, of electricity to produce. Um, and the way that the market is currently working is that the price of electricity is still dictated by the price of gas. So we're putting forward proposals to government as well so that we can start to see those those cheaper technologies and the benefits of those cheaper technologies feed through both to domestic and, and non-domestic customers as well i'm gonna i'm gonna stick on this theme here and i'm taking host privilege so i realize that i've been asking my own questions not just ones from the chat uh, but i'm going to go back to the chat uh, because one of the and we talked a bit about storage paul you were talking a lot about upping uh storage uh, to make sure that you know if we are generating more of our own homegrown energy how can we be able to store that properly how can we make sure our we are resilient through storage um and steve makes the very good point that much larger energy storage capacity is needed on the network and neil and paul i'd be really interested to get your thoughts on this neil in terms of what the government is doing to support the development of that uh, and paul whether you think there's anything businesses could be doing themselves to get ready for that well, I, I, I... People, when you look at the demand, and, and there's a website that I would offer up in the chat, um, if people have not you've seen it before, um, but Gridwatch Templar, just gets you an idea of how the demand ramps up in the day. And it gives people an understanding of how their contribution to the demand uh, works. So it's, it's a pretty well-trod path of, of what the demand's gonna look like tomorrow and the day after. Um, but that is that is going to change, and it is changing. And, and and I'll I'll give you the the example. You know, if we have a time scale of say ten years, between somewhere between five and fifteen years, when people are not using gas for domestic and business properties anymore in terms of gas, mean meaning methane. We've got to quantify that these days. Um, but standard methane use. If if the the demand starts to come to the electricity network, um, the gas companies. When they're shipping, when when we are shipping our peak, uh, if we took that as one unit, the gas companies are shipping five times that in terms of energy usage. So there's a big gap to fill. So that number one point that everybody's talking about about energy efficiency, even you know we're all in the business of on the energy side of selling and shipping electricity or gas. If you're in the gas side, why would we want to talk about energy efficiency to lower our sales if you like but no we need that as a as a country we need energy efficiency and we need storage 
And when you see the size of the peak, and that peak is roughly speaking between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m., you know, if people started coming home from work earlier or, or coming home from work later or cooking their dinners later and having baths and heating their houses later or earlier, that would change. And heat pump profiles are different to gas fired profiles actually so all of that forecasting is going to change by how people use energy and so we have a dedicated unit looking at the forecasting um, but you know let's get it out there that business forecast business forecasting should be a bit easier because the business should tell us what their running regime is compared with domestic and electricity for evs is a big issue for us the storage problem is not the three hours four or seven which a lot of the battery storage are trying to kill the storage problem is those three day of low wind um predominantly in the winter when when demand is high of how to do that into weak storage and so one of the key things is going to be what technology would win for taking for example 10 gigawatts of distributed um, offshore wind into some sort of storage and then using it next Wednesday. That's the that's the technical challenge that's out there. Um, and we I don't see an easy answer to that just yet, but that that is a problem that's out there. And that, so the, the short term storage, medium term storage, and then there's interweek and some people even call it interseasonal. That maybe you could build a lot of solar output uh, in sunny countries and package it somehow and store it into for the use in the winter. That's very much some of the future conversations going on in, in our industry. Thank you for that, Paul. Uh, Neil, did you have anything you wanted to add or comment on? I suppose I would just add there's there's a there's a part of Bayes that, you know, is focused entirely on particularly the most energy intensive and, and speaks to them regularly around demand reduction and, and things like that. So it's it's very much on our radar. Thank you. I uh, we have run over, um, but and I'm assuming that given the number of questions we still haven't gone into in the chat, that we could uh, spend a lot more time talking through this stuff. Uh, I will will make sure that we record those questions uh, and get some get some answers. Tom and his team will be working with Neil and others uh, on it, so we make sure we we get that uh, all answered. But just before we wrap up, were there any final thoughts? Uh, Neil, anything you wanted to share on your future plans? Tom and Juliet got a chance to talk about their dreams for the Chancellor's budget. Paul, is there anything you're specifically looking for? I mean, I'll come in and say on business, for businesses to this community, you know, talk to your DNOs, um, you know, make them aware. Um, what I need in, in Northern Power Grid, uh, Yorkshire in the North East, is people to come and tell us what their plans are for the future, when they're going to decarbonise, how much are they going to decarbonise? When are they going to start using more electricity? And um, so I can be ready to help them. And we've got people, you know, standing uh, throughout 2023, coming on stream more and more to spend time with this businesses, understanding what they're looking for. Thank you, Neil. Um, yeah, I suppose just two things for me. So, firstly, obviously the delivery challenge. So I think a lot of the questions in the chat um, are things we need to work through. I think someone was asking, who do we contact? It will be Bayes. Give us a week or two and we'll give you a, a dedicated point on that. And I think the second thing, um, and this has come up all week on all the calls I've done. So obviously at the moment we've published a set of information which Treasury agreed we would put in the public domain for the announcement. If if more information is required, please get in contact with me and then I can speak to Treasury and see see what more can be released. Because I don't, I don't think what we've published now will be the end. I think it's just understanding what more businesses particularly would find valuable and then obviously getting Treasury to agree that. So please get in touch on those data points. That's uh, that is an excellent point to end on, Neil. Thank you for that. And thank you for the offer. I'm sure people will be taking taking you up on that. I think uh, as you work through the practicalities of this, make sure you uh, use us uh, and use all people on this call and many others to understand how it's going to land um, when it hits the real world uh, and make sure that we're not we're not missing anything. That would be great. Thank you, everybody, for coming to our CBI at 10 today. Uh, I'm Simon Fassi-Aldridge, your host, and we will see you at the next one. Thank you very much. Bye.